Greetings, peace and blessings, shalom, shalom to all the Hebrew camps, congregation, the Knesset, the nations, near and far and scattered abroad. I am Chief Priest Banyala, and I am doing an intro class to the main class, Return of the Messiah. This is a very, very, very powerful class, so take copious notes, be as studious as possible, because since age immemorial, we've been talking about, or people have been talking about, the return of Jesus Christ. You know, and they go further and go on and on and try to put an image up, and we know that image is not true. And if that image is not true, a lot of other things are not true. And so it is critically important that we know specifically what the Messiah was talking about when he spoke about a return. I'm joined today by my reader, disciple priest Raash, and I'm joined today also by apprentice priest Yehezekiel. And we will start this lesson today. Once again, I say it, it, it behooves you to take copious notes, all right, because we are in the midst, we are in an age of true biblical spiritual enlightenment. And he who applies himself with the full veracity that the Heavenly Father has given him, the same is the type of character that will be saved. We're going to start in St. John, St. John 2.19. <clears throat> St. John, chapter 2, 19. How shall I answer and say unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Messiah said something profound to the Pharisees. If you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. And being Pharisees, being carnal, they couldn't understand his metaphors. They couldn't understand his idioms. They couldn't understand his wisdom. What did they reply with? Then the Jews said, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? So they returned with a retort saying, It took us. I mean, it took us 40 and six years to do this. What are you talking about? And what was he talking about? Let's read. But he spake of the temple of his body. So he was saying something different than what they were perceiving. A carnal man would look at it and say, he's literally talking about brick and mortar. But his dialogue, his banter, his wisdom is always cloaked in mysticism or it is cloaked in a allegory or a parable. And so when he spoke about destroying the temple and raising it up in three days, if he used parables and allegories for that, would he not do the same? When he spoke about his return? Or would we be like the Pharisees saying, 46 years, brother, he's going to come down and we're going to see a picture of this guy in the sky? Are we going to behave carnally? Are we going to comport ourselves in a spiritual manner? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6.18. 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee fornication. So now we have here, it is codified in wisdom in this new covenant. Flee fornication. And I know from every pulpit, they have told you that fornication is all this sexuality going on. All, right, all this sexuality, you got to hear all that fornicating going on. And what they have done is rob you of true wisdom. Let's get wisdom of Solomon. The 14th chapter in the 11th verse, we're going to come back to 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Let us digest and comprehend what fornication really is. Let's wisdom, read. Wisdom of Solomon 14 and 11. Therefore, even upon the idols of the Gentiles shall there be a visitation. The Heavenly Father said that he is going to visit specifically the idols of the Gentiles. You know, you go to the Catholic Church and you see Mother Mary with child in bosom. That's an idol. That is a graven image that the Heavenly Father said, thou shalt not make that abomination. You know that carcass that's hanging on that, that cross on your wall? That is an abomination. That is an idol. Your lucky rabbit's foot, that is an idol. That good luck charm you got, that's an idol. The Heavenly Father said he's going to visit those things because they serve to do one purpose. It is to... Bring you away from the power of Abba Yahweh. So you got that rabbit's foot? Oh, boy, I got to have my rabbit's foot. You are not praying to Abba Yahweh for protection. That rabbit's foot is your protection. 
All right, so he forbade that. He said, I'm going to visit every one of them and everybody who made a, a, a idol. Let's read on. Because in the creature of Abba, they are become an abomination and stumbling blocks to the souls of men. They have become an abomination and a stumbling block to the soul, the core, the essence of man. This is what we're getting into in these class. We're talking about the essence, the soul of man. And so an idol become an impediment for you to enter into the heavenly realm of the most high because you're now looking at rocks and sticks and carnality and carbon as the creator of all things, as opposed to the heavenly father. Let's finish that. And a snare to the feet of the unwise. Chapter. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 11. And a snare to the feet of the unwise. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication. What is spiritual fornication? Read it again. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication. So we, especially Israel, especially those of us of the seventh covenant, are now wedded to Abba Yahweh. We in marriage with the Heavenly Father. And so when you go over to the chapel and you go and engage in that madness, you pretty much treating that chapel like a, like a side piece. You're going astray to the Heavenly Father. You, you got your little thing you dilly-dallying with on the side, and then you come back in Abba Yahweh's face. The, the, the incredible thing is the Heavenly Father sees it all. And so true fornication is not talking about what man is doing. This is what the church have devolved it into. So that they can point at you and make you feel some kind of way. You're fornicating, boy. When true fornication is what they're doing. The Pope himself is a major fornicator. All of those idols, all of those renderings, all right, all of that stuff on the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo, all, all that stuff is idolatry. And the Heavenly Father said clearly here that this is the beginning of of spiritual fornication when you create these idols. Let's read on. And the invention of them, the corruption of life. And the invention of these idols became the corruption, the deteriorating of the life of man. This is how it destroys the soul. All right, let's go back and see what was written in Corinthian. Paul wrote this to the church of Corinth. Let's read the 18th verse again. 1 Corinthians 6 and 18. Flee fornication. So now we understand, not flee sexuality, being promiscuous. Flee the idols of the Gentiles, the religiosity that is covering the world. Flee it. Leave it alone. Read on. Leave your Bible. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. Now, every sin he's saying that you're doing is without the body. And we know what sin is. You trespass. You may have ate that pork. And then it turns into sin. That's something outside the body that happened, that occurred, that brought that type of sin about. Read. But he that committed fornication. But he that is worshiping an idol. Read. Sin it against his own body. You're sinning within now. You got that spirit within. You, that trespass was in. And that sin is proliferating from within. You didn't need any pork. You didn't need something external to make that happen. You are literally creating that from within. Read on. Verse 19. What? Know ye not your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So now getting back to what the Messiah said, if you destroy this place, I will build it again in three days. He spoke of his body. Now, we have Paul coming back reiterating the same sentiments. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Most High? And so now, let's understand what happened in the temple that he was talking about. If you destroy it, I'll build it again. Were they in there exercising? All right, so clearly, your body is the temple. Don't mean go to L.A. Fitness and work out. Where they having all kind of vegan culinary, you know, cuisines in the, in the midst of the temple? No, it's not about health. It's not about eating good. We have all the health practitioners talking about trying to quote this scripture. Are you the temple? Yeah, that means you eat well. Nothing wrong with eating well, but let's not misalign what the Messiah was talking about. 
Read that again. First Corinthians 6 and 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is the temple. So the same thing they was doing in that physical temple, which is and which was sacrificing. That's the ultimate. That is the high charge of the temple. It wasn't to go there and to judge. It wasn't to go there and study. It wasn't to go there and teach. It was none of that. How do we know? It's codified in Leviticus, uh, in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Ezekiel. They tell us exactly what was going on. In the history of Israel, they went to the temple to sacrifice on the brazen altar or the golden altar or to be baptized in the laver and so that they may worship the Heavenly Father, specifically and specially on high holy days. And so now the Messiah, let us understand what he's talking about. He was saying, if you destroy this physical temple, I will afford each and every one of you the opportunity to do the same thing within this body, internally. Understand the deep metaphors, the allegories, the dark sentences of the Messiah, Malak Zadok. Simpletons will not make it because they're simple. We know that these things are complex. We know that these things may be arduous. But the Holy Spirit is giving us, Rekakwadash, the Ruach to some, is giving comprehension and understanding of the wills and the ways of Abba Yahweh. So in this Feast of Unleavened Bread, let us comprehend even more. Let's finish that. AP. Which is in you, which ye have of Abba, and ye are not of your own. Verse 20. For ye are brought for a price. Therefore, glorify Abba in your body. So he now told you that your body is the temple. Now I want you to glorify, worship, praise him inside that temple. He's letting you know something deeper is going on here. But Hasatan is turning around saying, no, 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 no. Look for the biggest church you can find. Obviously, something good is happening in there. Look for the church with all the fancy cars in the outside. Obviously. Fancy cars represent God is blessing them. Now look for, when you go in that church, the best dressed women with these frisbee flying saucer hats on, the bigger the hat, the more righteous everything is. This is what Satan is telling you, but the Messiah turned around and said, dig within. This is why he said every man and woman have to work out their own soul salvation. You have to endeavor deep within yourself, and you have to clean everything within you you have to assume evil and replace it with righteousness and he's showing you the way to do it the return of the messiah is at hand let's finish that and in your spirit so you must worship the heavenly father in spirit why because our father is a spirit and he who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth not in carnal big churches that's not what it's all about that is not an indicator of success you're not helping anybody. You're doing another an aristocratic thing. They've already gone through that. All the peons give theirs to keep the aristocrats up. In that particular case, keep the pastor and his wife up. When the Heavenly Father created this so that every man can correct himself. Read that 20th verse again. For ye are brought for a price. Therefore glorify Abba in your body and in your spirit, which are Abba's. All right. And so he's now telling you to glorify, which means to worship the Heavenly Father within your physical body, within your soul, within your spirit. There must be some internal worship. The Heavenly Father is teaching you how to go within. You don't need some Zen master Buddhist to teach you. All of that crap that they got, they stole it from the Hebrews, and they only knew a portion. It's fake. It's a knockoff. It's no frills. The Heavenly Father is bringing again the true worship to the saints in these latter days. Let's now go to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. We'll pick it up in the 20th verse. And this is only a pretext, a pre-class to the real class that is coming where the brothers are going to show you how the Messiah is here already. I know we don't watch movies where we got this gentle person flying out of the sky, li uh, lights radiating from behind him. And the whole world is like, Jesus has returned. 
But as it was in the days of old when the Messiah came amongst them, did they know he was the Messiah? They denied him. And the same thing will happen when he returned this day. They're going to be utterly unaware, but not the saints, not the saints. Luke 17, verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of Abba should come, he answered them. So the Pharisees looked around and said, hey, look, look, I see all the stuff you're doing, all the miracles. Just tell me one thing. When is the kingdom of the Most High Abba Yahweh going to come? Answer me that. What did he reply? He answered them and said, The kingdom of Abba cometh not with observation. What a, read that again. The kingdom of Abba cometh not with observation. He said it clearly and profoundly. This kingdom that's going to come, you're not going to sit back and observe it coming out of the sky. It's not going to come with the physical, visible, Optics. Now he's letting you know I'm getting deeper. I'm getting deeper. I already told you I'm going to build a temple again. And I'm going to bring worship again. And you're not going to physically see it coming out of the sky. Then how shall the kingdom come and the Messiah return? Read. Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Neither shall they say, lo, here, or Lo there. They're not going to say, hey, 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 did you see that? It happened right over there in England. Messiah came. Oh, did you see that? It was over there in Kenya. The Messiah came. He was in the sky. Did, did, you, did you see that eclipse? That was the Messiah. You didn't see him hanging behind the eclipse. He says, it's not how it's going to happen. How's it going to happen? For behold, the kingdom of Abba is within you. The kingdom. The Messiah shall return, and it shall be within you. The same metaphor was given about the temple. They just could not understand the cryptic message that he was giving them. I'm going to destroy this temple and build it again in three days. A layman was literally looking for bricks. He was saying, this is day two. He ain't even started. Man, he ain't even get no shipments of bricks in yet. This guy's a false prophet. Not a false prophet. You did not understand the depth, the gravity magnitude of truth that he was bestowing upon the laps of these people. And even to this day, carnal minds trying to digest spiritual things always create a problem. And that's what we have today, a major, major conundrum, a problem. People are projecting things that the Messiah did not say. He's now saying, you're the temple, you're going to worship the Heavenly Father in you, and you're going to see the kingdom of the Most High come within you. Now, what does that mean? We could take that. We can run and do a thousand things with it. Let's get Ezekiel, the 8th chapter, and the 12th verse, specifically what the Messiah was talking about. Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 12. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? So the angels is saying unto Ezekiel, I'm going to give you some privy information. It's an in-depth information about the children of Israel. Check out how recidivist they are. I want you to see what they do. What were they doing? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. Wow, every man in his chamber of imagery. Everyone must recognize and realize that you have a room, a chamber that holds images. What is that chamber called? Your mind. It's certainly not your foot. It's your mind. What do you have an image of? You got an image of something good. You could have an image of something perverse, something evil. And so when the Messiah is talking about the kingdom of heaven is coming within, he's talking about within your chamber of imagery. He's going to show you what to think on and how to manipulate and control and adjust those thoughts. For as a man think it, so is he. So as Satan takes over your mind, you are of the devil. But if the Messiah, the prince, put seeds in you, germinate those seeds, bring forth plants to bring forth fruit, you take that fruit to act upon it, you have brought life into the world. And so now he's showing you that the kingdom will come. He will return in your chamber of imagery. I know it sounds fanciful right now, but we're going to show you some more specifics in this series. Read that again. 12th verse. Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 12. Then said he unto me, 
son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, the most I see does not. The most I had forsaken the earth. All right, so in their mind, their chamber of imagery, they have denounced the Heavenly Father. And in our minds, we have to detox at time when we come into this covenant because it has been so ingrained in your consciousness. Somebody could say Jesus Christ and what pops up? Absolutely. A European character with long hair. I don't care. You, they could have told you, hey, the Messiah's a dark skin. Yeah, I know. Got some work I got to do. Because they've been doing this to you specifically, auto-suggesting. What is this called? Get Luke 17 and 22. Uh, no, Matthew 11 and 12. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence. Ah. From the days of John the Baptist, even unto this very day, your chamber of imagery is under attack. TikTok is attacking it. YouTube is attacking it. YouTube Shorts is attacking it. The church is attacking it. In printing that image, that false image, that false deity in your chamber of imagery has attacked and littered this precious realm called your chamber of imagery. Why? For all one purpose, so that the Messiah won't return within it. See, it is the spirit, the soul that quickeneth that will come alive. The body profit nothing. And so carnality is not what the Heavenly Father is investing in. He's investing into the souls. This is where all the miracles came from. It didn't come from the man had some, you know, technological advance than anybody else. It was that they were connected to the Heavenly Father in spirit. Let's read that again. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So we know that the kingdom of heaven is your chamber of imagery. It suffered violence, and that violence has incarcerated your soul. It has taken it and bound it by force. And coming into the seventh covenant is making you free. When you know the truth, the truth won't set you free. That's an assertion. The truth will make you free. This is the Messiah who's the truth. He comes in and liberates you from all the shackles, lies, deception that the world has put out, preparing, conditioning your chamber of imagery to meditate, marinate, and to worship the Heavenly Father internally. Let's get Luke, the 17th chapter, and let's pick it up in the 22nd verse. Luke. Chapter 17, verse 22. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say unto you, See here, or see there, who not after them, nor follow them. He said, The days are going to come. The days are going to come. When I'm going to be extracted from this place and everything I taught you, there's going to be a dearth, a famine of hearing this truth. Let's read. Or oh, as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. He said here clearly. There's going to come a time when there's going to be a drought of seeing the Messiah, and then it's going to happen like lightning striking from one part of the earth to the other. Now, some may physically, may leave all the spiritual talk that we just talked about and go back to physically looking for lightning and say, I saw Christ. But let's understand the spiritual dynamic that he was preaching. Let's get St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Let's pick it up first at the 17th verse. And the 70 return again with joy. All right, the Messiah, besides the 12, went and got 70 apostles and went and commissioned them to go out and to chase down demons. Where do demons reside? In your chamber of imagery. Where do sin reside? In your chamber of imagery. No such thing as a haunted house. But there are possessed people. All right, they don't want to be in wood, stick, bricks. Wood, sticks, and bricks and asphalt don't feel anything. People feel things, all right? They're addicts for that pleasure. 
That's sensationalism. They need that. They want that. Even to the degree when the Messiah was getting ready to cast out legion, they was like, hey, don't do me like that, homie. Don't do me like that. Yeah, they put me in the swine. They still can feel. They still can eat. They still procreate. And he said, all right, go ahead and do that. They don't want to be in a house. They want to be in you. Let's read. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Yahweh Shai, even the devils are subject unto us. So the 70 returned and said, Messiah, even these demons and spirits of sin are subject unto us, the power that you gave me. Now he's giving more uh, hints. He's giving you more understanding about what the kingdom is. You're going to have power to control your consciousness, and you're going to have the ability to take away the evil out of other people's consciousness. All right? Let's read on. Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld. So when this happened, when the apostles went and snatched sin, devils, evil ones, out of the minds, out of the chamber of imagery of their brethren, the Messiah said what? I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. This is the lightning that he's talking about. Satan is falling from his lofty perch. This is Revelation 12. There was war in heaven. That heaven is your chamber of imagery. Michael and his angels fought against Hasatan and his angels, and there was no more place found for them. They fell out of your chamber of imagery. So now he's talking about this. They're going straight down. So when Hasatan falls, losing power over the person that they once possessed. We're going to come back to Luke in a moment. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Speaking about this Satan falling like lightning. The Messiah said, when I come, this is going to be a sign of me coming. You're going to find Hasatan falling out of the chamber of imagery of people. Like lightning, sin is going into remission. This is a sign of the return of the Messiah, the Prince. I know that there are those stuck on uh, Matthew, the 24th chapter. They want to see wars, Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Zelensky. Oh, boy, they're going to nuke that man. We in the last days. Ah, there is a, a, a comet coming or an eclipse coming on April, April 8th. That, boy, that is the rapture. The Messiah didn't say that. He didn't say anything about no eclipse going to be a rapture. Or he going to. X out a country. I don't want to get into it now, but we're going to talk about those prophecies soon as the feast is over. What blasphemy. What ridiculousness. This is why the saints feel used all the time. They go from one fake prophecy, one false prophecy, to another false prophe prophecy. You know the sad thing is, too? That these projectors of false prophecies don't ever get condemned. They project those false prophecies, and when it don't come to pass, oh, oh guess what else is happening? No, 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 brother, back it up, back it up. You told me that in 2019, well, 400 years was up since 1619, and we're getting up out of here. It's 2024, and we ain't out of here. You know what the scriptures say you do to somebody like that? Absolutely, fly that head, take it right off. You see it rolling down the hill? Yeah, yeah, that brother's over there talking all that prophecy stuff that didn't come to pass. What would that do? That'll make people say, I ain't prophesied a damn thing. I ain't no spirit didn't hit me. Uh, mm -mm, I ain't doing that. But when you could just, with no consequence, yell out stuff, you know, you just keep doing it. You're getting clicks. Oh, I'm getting clicks. I'm getting paid off of that. But what you're doing, you're damaging people because hope deferred make it the heart sick. You got people saying, man, we're getting out of here. I'm so glad. I'm, I'm putting everything on it. But then, and then that time come and go, oh, man, I'm just... Still got to be here? Tell the truth. And the truth is, the Messiah is telling you straight up, I'm coming internally. All right, when David spoke about being quickened, he was like, quicken my soul. Quicken means make it alive. Bring it to life. Not the body, not the flesh, my soul. Let's get 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1 about this Satan falling from heaven like lightning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord. What is that? We are talking to you about the coming of the Lord. Don't they knock on your door? Can I talk to you about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? This is the true coming 
of the Messiah, the Prince. Oh, what do, what, what is Paul telling the church of Thessalonica? What is he telling them about the coming? Let's read. By the coming of our Lord, Yahawashai, Messiah, and by our gathering together unto him. And us gathering together, waiting upon him. In assembly, together, waiting on the return of the Messiah. Let's read. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Messiah is at hand. All right, he said, don't soon be shaken in mind. And don't be troubled neither by spirit or word. Don't let nobody shake you from this. Or letter, like you receive a letter from us talking about something else. Yeah, don't believe it. I am telling you right now, the day of the Messiah is at hand. And it was at hand. And it is at hand. Meaning, at hand is a Hebrew phraseology, meaning it's very close to you. It's at a hand's length. It's right there. We are in it. He wasn't saying thousands of years from now. He was like, in their day, the kingdom of heaven was there. And so in our day, it's here as well. Let's read on. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you. Look at that major admonishment. Don't let no man trick you. That's going to be the major trial you're going through. People are going to trick you or tip the trick. Paul said, if they take my letters and start making them carnal, don't believe it. If they take Peter's letters and notes and start making it about a physical apparition, don't believe it. Be not deceived by any means. Read. Let no man deceive you by any means. For, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. All right, let's go back to that. That's powerful right there. It says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day. What day? What day is he talking about, people? The first verse. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our, our, our Messiah, Yahweh Shai. That's the day. So he said that day, the coming of the Messiah will not happen except there be a falling away first. All right? Those of you waiting on April 8th, you got your bags packed. You ready to go to heaven? All right. Did the falling away happen first? Did that happen? You out of order. You out of order. And we're going to talk to him on April 9th. All right, we're going to talk to them on April 9th with pie in their face, telling them to stop being so deceived and simple. Let's read that again. He has a kill. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now, what is the falling away? Let's go right back to Luke 10, 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick it up at 18. 18. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. So that falling away that's being taught to the church of Thessalonica, Paul is saying to that church that Satan must fall out of your chamber of imagery. He must leave your chamber of imagery before we start seeing the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. Why? Because the spirit of wisdom will not dwell in the body that's subject to sin. And so Satan has to leave. So the first step is seeing the assuaging of these spirits of sin, taking them away, removing them. This is the first step. Not wars and rumors of wars, not earthquakes. And you seeing troops walking down the street and New York City has uh, the National Guard in the train, the subway station. Oh, we in the last days, you are looking in the wrong direction. Revelation 7, we spoke about it in the class unveiling. He said, hold back the four winds until I've sealed my servants where? In their forehead, not in their feet, not in their body, not in their bank account. I have to seal them in their forehead first. A falling away got to happen. And then I got to seal their forehead. And then I'll let Vladimir Putin touch that, touch the nukes. Then I'll let America bring their F-35 fighters. In. But until I seal my servants, that ain't going to happen. They can want to touch that button, but their fingers will just gnarl up. I can't do that. Can't do it. Because some of the servants of the Most High have not been sealed. If you push that nuke, you're going to hurt the Most High's anointed. He told you already, touch not my anointed. Do my servants no harm. So they cannot do it until 
this chamber of imagery is cleaned out of sin, and then the Most High instill the Holy Spirit within you. All right, let's read. Call the chapter and verse. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Now, we can move on. Let's go back to Thessalonians. Read that third verse again. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. Now the man of sin must be revealed. And it's cringeworthy when you hear people break this down. They always assert anybody they hate. I saw the Christians when Barack Obama was praying. Hey, this is Barack Obama. He's a man of sin. Yeah, he's that. Yeah, exactly. Not Antichrist, Antichrist. He's the Antichrist. And they go on and on and on with their madness. Anybody they hate is always the negative opposition. All right? And then Hebrews get it and say, who is this? Who, 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 who is this, this, this man of sin? The white man. You limiting the strength and power of Abba Yahweh. Who is this man of sin? We talk about it already. Genesis, the fourth chapter, Rashid, the fourth chapter. We're not going there. He's telling you already. It is this evil, pronounced spirit of sin. All right? We're talking about Hasatan. We're talking about Bohemoth and Leviathan. We're talking about those fallen watchers who utilize the court of the Heavenly Father. Your trespasses against you give them authority to enter into you. And when they enter into you, they enter your chamber of imagery. So he said a falling away has to happen. And that man or the understanding of sin has to be revealed. Do we understand sin now? We are in the last days already. He's going to go down and tell you that it's a mystery of sin. The mystery of iniquity is already working. Satan don't want this to be public. He don't want it to be published. He don't want it to be forecast and projected into the world. Because you now see him. It's like a little snake with camouflage on, a little rattlesnake, all camouflaged in the leaves. And somebody says, it's a snake right there. Give it up. Don't give up my spot. He don't want you to know he right there. That's part of his tactic so he can bite you. But if they say he's right there, camouflaged, look like leaves. He's right there. Look at him. See him? You are aware now. He doesn't have the power. And so he want to stay camouflaged behind lies. And so the truth is, sin is not breaking law. That's called a trespass. The most I gave you a trespass offering over that. Sin is unmitigated trespasses. Now turn to sin. What does sin reside? In your chamber of imagery. And so this is what's got to come out. This is what the Messiah was saying. When you start seeing people dredging out sin, burning sin, getting rid of sin, you are now witnessing the return of the Messiah, the Prince. Let's read on. Ending of verse 2, verse 3. The son of perdition. All right, the son of destruction. So sin in your chamber of imagery is there to destroy you and to destroy the world. It never brings forth anything good. Continue. Who opposed it and exalted himself above all that is called Abba. So when sin gets in you, it is in opposition of anything good. Sin never comes in you and say, hey, you know what? Why don't, why don't you fast from evil? The Messiah said, well, can Satan cast out Satan? Absolutely not. They're going to come against you and be in opposition to everything godly. They're going to recreate godliness. They're going to have you doing this false godliness. This is what's dwelling in our chamber of imagery. Let's read. Or that is worshipped. Or that he as Abba seated in the temple of so Abba. So he, I'm going to read it as it is, as God sitting in the temple. Temple of God. What did we just find out the temple of the Most High is? It's you. You are the temple. 1 Corinthians 3, I mean, 316, absolutely. You are the temple. So where is he sitting? In you, in your chamber of imagery, saying, I am God. What does that mean? Thou shalt kill. Thou shalt lust. You see it? Go over there, lust, yeah. Thou shalt covet. Go take that man's stuff. This is what sin does. He's in stark opposition to the Heavenly Father, sitting in our chamber of imagery. And we can't do anything about it. I got these thoughts I don't know what to do with. You try it. You try to chain yourself down in a basement like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. 
And there ain't a chain on the world can stop sin. That's not how you get rid of them. Heavenly Father gave us a way to extract him, exterminate him, and to burn it. And when this comes upon the earth, you are in the last days. Men of our generations and generations before had no help. It was just go to a psychiatrist who has plagued himself. And they give you some, some pharmacia, some drugs to try to manage it. Don't work. Let's read on. Shewing himself that he is Abba. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withhold it, that he might be revealed in his time. So he said, I told you these things, and the Heavenly Father will reveal the truth of sin within his time. And this is the time. We didn't discover this. This didn't come because of our intellectual prowess. This didn't come because I'm smart. It came because the Heavenly Father told the angels, now's the time. Release the understanding about sin. Now's the time to purge and cleanse their chamber of imagery. Now's the time to get the dark side out and bring in that quickened light, brightness. The Messiah is now being sent in the midst. The kingdom of heaven has arrived. Let's read. For the mystery of iniquity. Check that out. Iniquity and sin, synonymous, the exact same thing. The mystery of sin, read. Do it already will. Is already working. Satan is already trying to make it. You know, cloak and dagger. He's trying to hide the understanding. Even in their day, they knew it. But they also knew that Satan was trying to push it back to something remedial and small. And now the Heavenly Father hath taken off that veil and revealed the truth in the last days. And to us, or to the saints, I should say, that will be ordained to be saved. This make all the sense in the world. But to those who were not chosen, this is trash. The pastor didn't say it, so it ain't true. Let's read. Until he be taken out of the way. Once again, taken out of your chamber of imagery. There's a way. The root is in how he will be taken out of your chamber of imagery. Read. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Mosai shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. All right, that's powerful. It will be consumed by the words of the mouth. We went through this in the unveiling of wisdom of Solomon, the 18th chapter. We're not going to go through it again. But it says, Moses overcame the destroyer, not with strength, not with might, not with arm, but with a word did he overcome those evil spirits. And the same thing he's saying now, there's going to be a spiritual uh, method that the Heavenly Father is going to deliver. Let's get Luke, go back to Luke, the 10th chapter, pick it up in the 19th verse. And if you will, give me James, the 5th chapter. As we began to bring this class to a close. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents. All right, I give you power to tread upon serpents. You know how carnal people are? They got churches where they're picking up rattlesnakes. And they're running through it and getting bit and dying. And then the next person come up, I'm going to pick it up. And he get bit and die. And this is a long tradition. He's not talking about that carnal man picking up serpent he's talking about that old serpent the devil and satan i give you power to trample over satan is what he's talking about that's something the rattlesnake looking at him like you stupid i'm gonna bite you because you're stupid that's why i'm gonna bite you i really don't want to but I'm, I'm gonna do that he's not talking about a snake he's talking about that age old serpent that enchanter that talked to eve that devil, those evil spirits. Let's read. I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And scorpions, the same thing. And over all the power of the enemy. Who? The enemy, the adversary. He's saying the kingdom of heaven has arrived when I give you power over all of these evil spirits. Read. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Uh, nothing shall hurt you. Nothing shall cause trespasses and sin upon you. Continue. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Not with, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written 
in heaven. All right. Rejoice because you have made or gotten a victory over the world. Don't rejoice that these spirits are now being tamped down. That's cool. Understand it. But that's not the gravity, the magnitude. There's something greater than that. That's only one step. Next step is enter into the kingdom of the Most High. And so we're not waiting upon some, somebody to come from the sky and, and, and to massage your head and shoulders and say, hey, let me pick you up. He's telling you how he's coming. I'm going to give you the power to trample over these evil spirits that have been malignant in your chamber of imagery, and you will dash them to pieces, and you will enter into the kingdom of Abba Yahweh. Let's leave there, and let's go to um, James 5, verse 7. James chapter 5 and verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of our Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth and had long patience for it. All right, he said, be patient and be like a farmer. All right, once you, once you learn how to, or that the kingdom of heaven is coming within, don't hasten. Be patient. Take everything. Take Go and break up your fallow ground. And now go and lay seeds. Now fertilize it. Now water. Be patient, though. Hasatan is not just going to scram because you're learning this. The battle is at hand. Be patient. Fight a good fight. Be a good soldier of the Messiah, the Prince. Let's read. Until he received the early and latter rain. So in due season and in due time, he's saying, as we read before, when the Heavenly Father will it. Be patient. Wait for the season. Fight the good fight until the Heavenly Father have the season of redemption. Let's read. Verse 8. Be ye also patient. Establish your heart. There is the key. Be patient and establish your heart. Not the body, not big churches, not big cars, not fancy clothes. Establish, stabilize your heart, your mind. Make sure you stable. Stabilize your mind. Give me any plague, anything except the plague of the heart, the plague of the mind. All right, just chop, chop a leg off. All right, just don't make me crazy. If I'm crazy, I can't host the Holy Spirit. Read on. For the coming of Establish the, your mind for what? For the coming of the Lord, draw it nigh. Why? Because he's coming in your chamber of imagery. He's entering into your mind. It's going to happen and people are going to be unaware, like they was unaware when he returned on the earth. Uh, in, in, in antiquity. He was on the earth. Who are you, fella? And nobody. But he was there already. And we say, if I was there, I would have been, you would have done the exact same thing. We would have done the exact same thing until he revealed himself. But there were those who knew who he was. They said that wise men came at his birth. They knew exactly who was coming. Why? Because Ezra found out 400 years earlier, the most I said, I'm going to send him. These were studious men, well-educated men. And they waited on his return. And when he came, they said, now is the time. They brought him gold. Why? Because he's the king priest. He needed a golden altar. They gave him frankincense. He needed to burn it on a golden altar. Let me give him what he needs to fulfill his mission here on the earth, to burn those evil spirits of sin. Let's finish up. Verse 9. Grudge not one against another. All right, so he's saying, while you're sojourning here, stabilize, establish your mind, because the Messiah is coming into your chamber of imagery. We're going to leave that, roll over to Luke, the 11th chapter. As I said, this is only the intro to the mighty class that's coming. Priest Uriah is going to talk about some of the particulars that is going to happen in your chamber of imagery. Luke 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he, when he sees, one of his disciples said unto him, Messiah, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, our Father. All right. The Messiah was asked a question by his disciples. How should I pray? Well, I'll tell you how to pray. Our Father, which in Hebrew is Abaya. And so a proper translation would be coming to the lot of Abaya. What lot is Abaya? Eighth lot, absolutely. What do we do? We burn incense unto Abba Yahweh. So, I'm going to teach you how to pray. Come into the lot of Abaya. Read. Our Father, 
which art in heaven. Come into the lot of a buyer and enter into the second heaven. Go into your chamber of imagery. Go into holy meditation like Isaac. Go into holy meditation like Abraham. It says Isaac went in the field to meditate. What did meditate mean? He went into his chamber of imagery and was praising Heavenly Father. Read. Hallowed be thy name. He said, now do what people who have peace in their heart do. You confess his holy name. You come confessing the set-apart name of Abba Yahweh, which is a simply saying you allege the oath and covenants and tell the archangels and the cherubim why you are there. I'm here to praise Abba Yahweh. Let's read on. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom has come. How did his kingdom come? Read. Thy will be done. Thy will is being done. This is when the kingdom has come. When the will of the Most High is being done, where? As in heaven, so in earth. When what is happening in your chamber of imagery in the heavenly realm is starting happening on earth, the kingdom of heaven has returned to the earth. The angels are in the spiritual realm worshiping the heavenly father in Abiah and in Yeshua and in Shechaniah and in Yehoreb. He's in all the lots. When we start doing this, the kingdom of heaven has come. When we start replicating like Moses replicated and made a temple off a pattern that the Most High gave him in the mount. The kingdom of heaven came to the earth. Solomon said, this temple I built is a rendering, a resemblance of the temple that was in heaven. Not just the physical construct. We're not talking about the architectural designs. We're talking about the motions that was happening. Solomon set up, per his father David, 24 hours of worship, baptism. He gave him the corn, I mean the bread, the oil, the wine, all of that, the angels were doing in heaven. They set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Let's finish this up. Give us day by day our daily bread. Did anybody ever wonder when you was in Christianity, like what did this have to do with the Lord's prayer? Oh, maybe, maybe I'm saying, give me enough food. Don't let me starve. How important is that? Give me my, my, my food every day. Make sure the Olive Garden, you know, can feed me every day. This is not what he's talking about whatsoever because look at the effects of giving you your daily bread. Read. And forgive us our sins. Ah, so the daily bread, I take it and get my sins removed. Because we are in modern times, we have no concept of what's being talking about, spoken about. But time will not permit me to go to Leviticus, the second chapter, when the Heavenly Father says, if you're going to offer an offering to the Heavenly Father, a sin offering, a trespass offering, you take your bread and use it as a bread offering. They translate it as a meat offering. Read that last part again. Luke chapter 11, verse 3. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. So with that bread, you get sin removed out of your chamber of imagery. He's now teaching his apostles how to behave themselves unto the return. You take that bread and you use it as a sacrifice, an oblation to remove sin out of your chamber of imagery. And so what does it mean when it say daily bread? Let's get Acts real quick. 2, 46. Acts 2, 46. Acts 2 and 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. They continued daily in the temple. Daily in the temple. What did they do daily? Read. And breaking bread. Oh, this is what daily bread means. The apostles were there in the temple daily, or in the place of worship daily with their bread. Read. From house to house. Did eat their meat with gladness. That bread was called meat, Leviticus 2, meat offering, letting you know that the apostles came together and said the Messiah has ordained us to give a new covenant, New Testament sin offering. So they was going house to house. Brother, you got sin on you? I know you do. Let's go and do this. Let's give up that sin offering to get your mind clean. You got trespass on you too. Let's give up a trespass offering and get your consciousness clean. The kingdom of heaven has come unto thee. 
The kingdom of heaven has come unto you. Let's get it in uh, Acts, the first chapter. You know what? Uh, stay in the second chapter. We're going to pretty much get straight to it. Let's go to Acts 2.38. But this is what must happen before the kingdom of heaven can come unto you. Let's read. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. That's what has to happen first. You must repent. All right, the church has taught us that repentance is making good on bad decisions. All right? I fornicated. I repented. First of all, you don't know what fornicating is, and you don't know what repentance is. So you're saying I did some dilly-dallying with this person I shouldn't have dilly-dallied with, but I came afterward and said, God, I'm sorry. I repented. It has nothing to do with what the Heavenly Father is talking about. Repent. Let's read it again. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yahawashai Messiah, for the remission of sins. Pause right there and give me, I believe it's Acts 3.16. And so here he says, Repent and have all your sins removed. All right, let's look at that repentance. Read. Acts 3 and 16. And his name through faith. Jump down to the 19th verse. Repent ye therefore. Repent, which means what? And be converted. When you convert. Yeah, it means change, but it don't mean, you know, I don't do the bad no more. It's talking about convert. If you convert from Christianity to Islam, you change your covenant, or you change your religion. So Peter was telling the Israelites, you must convert from the sixth covenant. You must convert from the sixth covenant and embrace this gracious seventh covenant. Finish that out, AP. That your sins may be blotted out. So when you convert to the seventh covenant, in that covenant, I'm able to go in and snatch those divisive spirits of sin. But as long as you're in the sixth, I can't do anything for you. Because it's specific in the sixth covenant how you get rid of sin. How do you get rid of it? Anybody? You're offering, absolutely. But where? In Jerusalem, in the outer court, on a brazen altar, with a, with a golden altar. And you got to have some sons of Aaron. You got to have, you, we can go on and on and on. Peter is saying, I can't do nothing for you. Now you can stick with that complex covenant, or you can denounce it and embrace the gracious covenant, which we're able to do. Messiah said, you don't need the sons of Aaron. You now have become priest of the Most High and men. You're the royal priesthood of the seventh covenant. If the Messiah, in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, he said if he would have came, he would not have been a priest after the order of Aaron. For it is evident he came out of the tribe of Judah. And so now he's a new covenant priest after the order of Melchizedek, Malak Zadok. And so that's the priesthood in whom we held. And he's saying now, Repent, convert, so that we can snatch those evil spirits of sin out, and then you can receive the kingdom of heaven. Read that whole, that verse again, the 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Most High. So that when the Most High began to send forth the gift of the Holy Spirit, you can receive it. This is what it's talking about, people. You have to clean your chamber of imagery. And once it's clean, you have to keep it clean. You can go into a kitchen and you can clean that thing. You can leave. Nobody goes in there. Nobody tells you nothing. You come back, dust all over the place. You just can't clean it one time. You got to keep cleaning it. Go take you a bath and say, I'm good the rest of my life. You are deceiving yourself. You have to constantly wash yourself like you have to constantly wash your mind. Because the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and TikTok take it by force. All, right, all that little twerking and all that stuff is an attack on your mind. All right, when you see two-year-old toddlers twerking to some Megan Thee Stallion song or something like that, your mind has been corrupted. You got to go in there and scrape it out with a sin offering. You got to keep it clean to the return to the Messiah, bring forth those gifts within you. And they're going to be gifts of healing. It's going to be gifts of miracles. It's going to be almighty things personifying on a major level the kingdom thereof. 
Let's go right back to Acts 2 and finish up where you left off at as we begin to close this class. Let's get uh, Acts 2, 30, uh, 240. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. Or 0, 240. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. You know, everybody's talking about being saved. They're not telling you what to be saved from. Save yourself from this untoward. Toward means going to the Heavenly Father. Untoward is going away from the Heavenly Father. He said, save yourself from all of these recidivist people that are going away from the Heavenly Father. You got to learn how to clean your chamber of imagery. While they're waiting on a man to come out of the sky, you got you to leave them. You gotta, even if it's your family, you got to leave them. You got to get into the seventh covenant, start oblating, cleaning your chamber of imagery, waiting on the gifts of Abba Yahweh to come unto thee. Forsake the untoward generation. How do you do it? Let's read. Then they gladly... Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. They first were baptized. And baptized don't mean let's go down to the river and let us wash in the river. It's not that old Negro spiritual. It's not that old Christian spiritual. You doing the religiosity of the nations. I can't tell you how many videos I've seen Israelites go down to the water. Because it's a hundred movies with that in there. That look righteous. Because I saw it in a movie. That's not what the Most High told us to do. We got brothers going into a swimming pool filled with chlorine, baptizing folk. Get up. You're a new man. Because you saw the Christians do that. But you didn't see Moses do that. The old covenant, the sixth covenant, was our schoolmaster. It taught us what to do in spirit in the seventh covenant. Did Moses take them down to the water? No, he did not. He had this thing called the great brazen laver. And they talked about it. They were descriptive about it. How you had the bullocks facing every direction for a specific purpose. And a basin sitting on their back. All made of bra a brazen. All of an alloy or a metal that the Heavenly Father told them cannot corrode, cannot rust. It is free of sin or corruption. Now you take that water. And then you begin to wash yourself every time you give up a sacrifice. All right. This is how they baptize. They call it a Hebrew baptism. Going down to the river sounds good. Yeah, it's poetic, but it sure ain't right. Unless you are a Christian. Maybe just, that's Christianity. Well, it's not really Christianity. Because to be Christian means to follow the Messiah. And the true, the first Christians were the, the saints in the seventh covenant. But let's continue to read on. On the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. All right, 3,000 people converted. They repented. And they came into the seventh covenant. And they continued with the apostles' doctrine. What was the apostles' doctrine? Read. And fellowship. And in breaking of bread. Taking that bread, which the Messiah said, give us this day our daily bread, and use it in a meat offering, heave it and wave it, so that we may have our trespasses and sin forgiven. So they taught them how to engage in this purifying of the mind, so that you may see the return of the Messiah, the Prince. Let's read. And in prayers. Which is an oblation. Read on. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. All right, they ate their unleavened bread, their meat offering, with singleness of mind, knowing that we are extracting and exterminating and punishing even these evil demonic forces of sin so that the kingdom of the Most High can arrive here on earth. Let's finish that up. Praising Abba and having favor with all the people. 
and the most I added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Herein lies the understanding of salvation. All right, enter into the seventh covenant. Continue on with your oblations, getting your chamber of imagery filtered, cleaned out. You're now saved from what? The vices, the untowardness of this world. Everybody running away from Abba. You need to be the only one running to him. All right, I, well, not the only one, but you need to be with them that run to him. All right, we need to go toward the Heavenly Father, not untoward. And so in this series, you will begin to see the Messiah spoke about himself in the temple of the Most High. And when he spoke about himself, he gave specifics and detail. This wasn't about the optics. Again, this wasn't about his visage or appearance. These were keys to tell you how to get your chamber of imagery cleansed so that you can see, be a part of, and witness the return of the Messiah. Prince, we're going to begin this class. We're going to start off first with Priest Yara Dunn, letting you know more about the calendar that we have. Shalom. As we mentioned uh, yesterday, we have now released the printed copy of the 2024 through 2025 uh, biblical calendar. Now, as you notice, this one is a lot thinner than uh, the previous version because this one is just the dates of this calendar year. But that's because we are working on an app. If you didn't see the class yesterday, you definitely want to watch that where Priest Rasheem went through a thorough uh, breakdown of the app, showing you some of the features that we're planning on putting in there. Now, unfortunately, the app is not yet available, uh, but we're working uh, very hard to get that out as soon as possible. But you definitely want to get the uh, Calendrical Bible Study Guide, the printed copy, so you know when the dates of all the feasts are. Uh, and then as soon as that app is available, you want to get that so you can get all the information and start studying about the calendar. It's a very complicated thing. A calendar, especially a biblical calendar, is not a simple thing, uh, especially because we don't follow the moon. You got a bunch of people talking about the moon, but that is not how the Hebrews of ancient times actually followed a calendar. What they did was they used the sun, and they used the same thing given to Enoch. And once again, Enoch's calendar is not simple. It's not just a simple, you know, uh, uh, 364, that's it. No, there's a lot more to it. So in these calendrical Bible study guides, we talk about the moon and its purpose. Uh, you'll see the moon phases uh, throughout the year on each calendar page. Uh, and once again, there's way more detail on the moon uh, in the app itself. Um, so you definitely got to get the app as it's coming out. We also talk about the winds and the portals and everything related to uh, the calendar that Enoch laid out. So once again, it's definitely an informative book. Uh, and even if you get last year's calendar, you'll see a lot of the information that you'll need to study it. But the app, I'll be willing, uh, will definitely be a great feature and a great tool for any of the saints to have. So uh, once again, you can get the calendar on our website at shekinai.com slash calendar. And I'll be willing, we'll be making an announcement as soon as the app is available. Uh, I'll be willing to be available on iOS and Android. Uh, for all the saints to get and download. So without further ado, um, I'll pass it back over to Priest Uriah to uh, complete this main class on the voice of waters showing the coming again of the Messiah. Shalom, shalom. As we continue on, Priest Rosh, if you can grab me Revelations 1, verse 15, and A.P. Hezekiah hold Galatians 3 and 23. So as we discussed earlier and even yesterday, in regards to the coming of the Messiah, we shouldn't be expecting some mysterious, fanatical event. Or more so, we should be preparing day by day, night by night, evening by evening, morning by morning. Priest Raj, go ahead and grab that Revelations 1, verse 15. Revelations 1, verse 15. And his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they burn in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. All right. so. We see something very important, actually two key facts in here. His feet like it's a fine brass or brazen, which we'll cover as we go through the series. But then we're focusing on today, the voice as the sound of many waters. The voice as the sound of many waters, meaning the baptism, spoken baptism, because we're in a covenant in which we now speak our sacrifices. With such spoken sacrifices, our Abba is well pleased. A.P. Hezekiel, grab that Galatians 3, uh, pick it up at the 23rd verse. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. 
But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. All right, so we're starting in Galatians to show, compare, and contrast the Old Covenant, how we did it in the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament, and how we do it in the New Covenant, the Covenant of David. Uh, read verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Messiah, that we might be justified by faith. Ah, there it is, the schoolmaster. So we go back to the old covenant or the covenant of Moses so we can get a better understanding of the seventh covenant of David. Let's drop that and we'll pick it up at Exodus 30 and verse 17. And the heavenly father spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, his foot also of brass, to wash withal. All right, so just as we touched on today, Moses set up a laver of brass or a brazen laver so that we can wash. Specifically, keep reading. To wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. All right, so we got that water in there with this lava of brazen, this lava of brass. And we're going to see who washes in here. Verse 19. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. So they should wash their who? Shall wash their hands and their feet. Their hands and their feet. So as we get further on in this class, and we see something similar as far as their hands and their feet, then we see where it comes from. As far as the dumping yourself in water, we're going to find out today if that's biblical. Let's keep reading. Verse 20. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. That they die not so that when they come in the presence of the Most High, they are coming clean so that they can do what? Go ahead, priest. Or when they come near to the altar to minister. So that they can minister. So the very first thing we do before we start our oblations, we wash, then we anoint, so that, we, so that the priesthood may minister unto the Most High Abba Yahweh. Let's go. To burn offerings made by fire unto the Heavenly Father. There it is right there, verse 21. So they shall wash their hands and their feet. Once again, now the Most High is saying it a second time so that everybody understands clearly. You're going to wash your hands and feet. Then he comes back, he said, make sure you wash your hands and feet. Nothing else, your hands and feet. You're not dumping in, in a swimming pool. You're just washing your hands and feet. All right, we're going to drop that. Uh, matter of fact, continue on. So, that, so they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not, and it shall be a statute forever. It shall them. be a statute forever. Just like in Hebrew says, it says the law changed, sacrifice, but not the statutes nor the commandments. So if it says in the Old Testament in the covenant of Moses, it doesn't change when we get into the covenant of David in the times of the Messiah. All right, we're going to go ahead and drop that and pick it up at Exodus 40, verse 2. Let's get another reference of this lava just for those naysayers who don't believe. Let's get it. Exodus chapter 40 and verse 2. On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Uh, jump to verse 7. And thou shalt set the lava between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and shalt put water therein. All right, so we see that lava once again in the tabernacle of the congregation. Keep reading. Verse 8. And thou shalt set up the court round about. Uh, jump to verse 9. So we see that laver, and we talked about the anointing. So briefly, let's just touch that just for those who say, oh, you only got to baptize, and then that's all you got to do. And then for anybody who's saying you only baptize once, it's, it's, it's actually not biblical at all. He said back in Exodus 30, it said, you wash your hands and feet. It shall be a perpetual statue, meaning it shall be Every single day. We're going to go back to 40 and pick it up at the ninth verse. And thou shalt take the anointing oil. So that's a part of this preparation before we give the sin offering, the trespass offering, the peace offering, the thanks offering, the vow offerings, whatever it may be. You got the baptism and you have the anointing. It goes hand in hand. 
Jump to the 11th verse. And thou shalt anoint the lava on his foot and sanctify it. And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. So as we see in the covenant of Moses, the priesthood, they also wash. As what is said in the old covenant, we say baptism, wash your hands and or feet. The priesthood did the same thing. Nothing changed. Once again, statutes remain the same. Only the law changed. Verse 13. Uh, matter of fact, jump to the 15th point. Let's get straight to the point. And thou shalt anoint them, as thou didst anoint their father. So what are they baptizing, or washing, and anointing for? What's the reason? Keep reading. That they may minister unto me. So that they can give up those peace offerings, those thanksgiving offerings. Go ahead. In the priest's office. So they can fulfill their priestly office day by day. Keep reading. For the anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood through all their generations. Once again, everlasting. So if it's still going on, if it was going on then, it's still going on today. And let's jump to verse 30 and read on to verse 32. And he set the lava between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put water there to wash with all. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, and when they came near unto the altar, they washed, as the Most High commanded Moses. So if you are coming to seek the Most High through prayer and supplication, and you're not washing, you're not baptizing your hands and or your feet, then you're coming wrong. But we're going to go ahead and continue on. And we're going to touch on Joshua. We talked about Joshua on the Sabbath and how we essentially passed over Joshua. But we're going to look at the, another point in this third chapter of Joshua. Let's keep reading. Joshua 3, verse 13. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Heavenly Father most high of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan. All right, so that's the key word we're looking at today, the waters of Jordan. Jordan has been a prominent location from, from the times of the so-called beginning, from the fall of Adam, all the way till, uh, well, it's changed now, but it's still very important as far as our history. Let's keep reading. That the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above. So we got a lot of water going on in, the, in, in Jordan. Jump to the 15th verse. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. So pay attention to that. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, meaning it was very plush, marshy, big bank. 16, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon the heap very far from the city of Adam. That is besides Zaratan. All right, so look, pay close attention to that word Zaratan. We're going to see that again as we go deeper into this class. But keep reading, priest. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And All right, let's pause right there and get the etymology of that word brook, noun. Uh, you should see that. And start where it says Old English. So we got, Jer uh, they were in Jericho in that area, in the area of Jordan, a very plush wetland area. Let's see what we have here for the word brook. Brook, flowing stream, torrent, of obscure origin, probably from Proto-Germanic, Broca, which yielded words in German, Brook, and Dutch, Broek, that have a sense of marsh. Marsh, there we go. You read? In success, in Kent, it means water meadow, and in plural, 
low marshy ground. All right, so we're highlighting that so that when we get to this point in our class, we know exactly what marsh means or brook. Let's drop that and AP Hezekiel pick it up at 1 Kings 7 and verse 23. And he made a molten sea. We got another one, a molten sea. You know if it's a sea, it's water in it for sure. But we got a molten sea that was crafted. Let's read. Ten cubits from the one brim to the other. So it was pretty big. It was pretty big. We're not going to go into the dimensions of it, but it was pretty big. Ten cubits, 20 feet. All right, let's keep reading. It was round all about, and his height was five cubits. So it was, the, it was, essentially it was taller than a basketball rim. If anybody knows about basketball, it's about 10 feet high. It was taller than that, or about the same height, give or take. Let's keep reading. And a line of 30 cubits did come past it round about. So it was continually being filled with water. If baptism is an important now, what's the purpose of Solomon making a molten sea inside the temple? Was it just for decoration? We know that the Mosai is very specific, and he does everything for a reason. But let's continue reading on in verse 24. And under the brim of it round about, there were nups from passing it, ten in a cubit from passing the sea round about. Jump to 25. It stood upon 12 oxen. So it had 12 oxen all around this molten sea. Or should I say, resting upon the molten sea were 12 oxen. And where did they stand? Tree looking toward the north, and tree looking toward the west, and tree looking toward the south, and tree looking toward the east. And the sea was set above upon them, and all their hinder parts were inward. So as we have these oxen, they were facing outward, but the inward parts were surrounding each other. Meaning, with this molten sea, you had a surrounding brotherhood. That's what it, was, what it resembled. So you see today, you got the, the robust priesthood standing strong side by side throughout each and every oblation. It's the same thing we got here. Let's keep reading. Uh, jump to that uh, 27th verse. And he made ten bases of brass. So just as we talked about earlier in today's class in the introduction, we got those lavers of brass or those lavers of brazen where we can wash with all. So the priesthood uses the molten sea, and then everything from at that point was distributed to the congregation and everything else of, of, from that point. But let's go ahead in the 43rd verse. Jump down. And the ten bases and ten lavers on the bases. And we get it right there, those 10 bases. So you got five on the left and five on the right, all throughout the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 44. And one sea, and 12 oxen under the sea. Just a second, witness. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump to the 46th verse. In the plain of Jordan, did the king cast and We get it right there. So they made this molten sea in a wet, marshy area. Just like in when we were coming out of the campaign, when we were under Joshua, as we defeated the, 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 the enemies of Jericho, Solomon went back to the same area of Jordan to do what? Let's read. Verse in 46. The, read that the, again. In the plain of Jordan, did the king cast them in the clay ground between Sukkot and Zaratan. All right. Between Sukkoth. And Zaratan, which is the same thing that we just talked about in Joshua 3. Priest Watch, matter of fact, let's look at that one more time. Joshua chapter 3, and pick it up at the 16th verse. Joshua 3 and 16. That the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon and heap very far from the city of Adam. That is beside Zeraton. There we get it right there. So Solomon, looking at his history, looking at what his fathers told us, what, what his fathers told him, he went back to that same area that our forefathers went to. So as Solomon was being obedient and diligent and hearkening to the voice of his fathers, what should we be doing? The exact same thing. So if Moses said baptize or wash, and Yahweh said it, and David said it, and Paul said it, and John said it, 
Why would she, we be saying anything different? If they said wash their hands and feet, why would we go out and go swim in a, in a water park or whatever it may be and call that baptism? That wouldn't be the case. Let's keep reading. Uh, matter of fact, drop that for the sake of time and pick it up at 2 Chronicles 4, verse 2, uh, AP Hezekiah. And as we mentioned in 1 Kings 7, when he was casting this, he, everything Solomon did, right, he didn't, he didn't put nothing together in the holy area. He went outside, and then he just put everything together like a, a puzzle, or Legos. You know, that's why he said he cast them outside. And then he went in and put it together. And it was so heavy, he had so much brazen and gold and copper and silver that they just said, we're not even going to count it. It's too much glory up in here. We ain't even going to do it. But let's get that uh, Second Chronicles 4. Pick it up at the second verse. Second Chronicles chapter 4 and 2. Also, he made a molten sea of 10 cubits from brim to brim. There we get it. So now we can't say, oh, you're just pulling that. That's just one verse. So you just got, no, we got multiple witnesses. Perception upon precept, precept upon precept. The exact same thing. What does verse 3 say? And under it was the similitude of oxen, which did compass it round about. And we get it once again. And we talked about those lavers, the five on the left, five on the right. Let's get that um, verbatim. Start at the fifth verse, or sixth verse, I should say. He made also ten lavers and put five on the right hand and five on the left. To do what? To wash in them. To wash in them, not to just have a, a, a sprinkler fight. No, to wash so we can get to work, so we can do those oblations. Go ahead. Such things as they offered for the burnt offering, they washed in them. So you had um, lavers for the priests. You had lavers for the congregation. You had lavers for the sacrifice. You had lavers for everything. So everything in the Mosai's temple was ready to be cleansed at any moment. You had lavers in the front, middle, everywhere in the temple. Let's read. But the sea was for the priests to wash in. Like we talked about earlier. We said that the lavers was for the congregation. But the priesthood used the molten sea. That's what a Messiah baptizes the priesthood. Then we distribute it to the congregation. Let's drop that, AP Hezekiel. And Priest Raj, pick it up at 1 Maccabees. We're going to get another reference on this marshy area of Jordan. Go ahead. 1 Maccabees, chapter 9, verse 42. So when they had avenged fully the blood of their brother, they turned again to the marsh of Jordan. They went again to the marsh of Jordan. Priest Rosh, get that definition of marsh, uh, the noun marsh. Marsh. Tract of water, soaked, or partially flooded land. Wet, swampy ground. So we had a lot of opportunity to baptize in this river or this, this area of Jordan. It wouldn't even make sense to call it a river because everywhere it was just flooded. Wet, swampy ground. I uh, keep reading on. Go to that, the highlight portion of that definition. English Mersh from Old English. Merk, Mersk, Marishk, Marsh, Swamp. Swamp. So it's a lot of water we're looking at. Go to that second highlighted portion. Dutch Marsh, German Marsh, Danish Marsh, probably from Photo Germanic. Mari, C, from Pi root, Mori, body of water. A body of water. So when you see the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, when it talks about, and they went down to Jordan, and Yahweh was baptized in Jordan, we see why right here. Let's keep reading in that First Maccabees. Pick it up at the uh, First Maccabees 9, verse 43. Now when Maccabees heard hereof he came on the sabbath day unto the banks of jordan with a great power then jonathan said to his company let us go up now and fight for our lives for it standeth not with us today as in time past for behold the battle is before us and behind us and the water of jordan on this side and that side the marsh likewise in wood neither is their place for us to turn aside so we see earlier in the 43rd verse it said the banks of jordan 
we touched on banks, how that's a large body of water, and we just touched on marsh. So once again, bank is a flowing stream, and marsh is that, that wetland, in so many words, a marshy wetland, full of water. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, continue in the 40, 46th verse. Matter of fact, jump to the 48th verse. First Maccabees chapter 9, verse 48. Then Jonathan and they that were in with him leapt into Jordan and swam over unto the other bank. Howbeit, the other passed now over Jordan unto them. So there, so there were slain of Bacchides side that day about a, about a thousand men. All right, so we're not going to go into the story uh, that was discussed there, but we just highlighting the key points of they were in the area of Jordan where there was a lot of water. We're going to drop that Maccabees. Let's pick it up, uh, Priest Rosh, at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. We're going to highlight John the Baptist, or somebody don't like calling him that, so they say John the Immerser. Nonetheless, John was a priest, the last priest of the Sixth Covenant, the Covenant of Moses, and he was doing a lot of washing. He was in that Jordan area consistently because that was his lot, to baptize those into the covenant so that he can prepare the way for the Messiah. Let's get uh, Matthew 3, and verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, yea, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, so just like we were talking about earlier, repent. Turn away from your wicked ways or turn away from idolatry, whatever it may be, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see brothers preaching this new covenant, teaching a gospel of peace, you know that the Messiah is, is coming sooner than later. Well, matter of fact, you know that the Messiah is here because where would he be if we weren't teaching, if we weren't preaching? I'm not sure, but we're here now. The Messiah is ready for us, and we're looking to continue to do these oblations daily. So repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as he was saying that, what else did he say? Or what did they say, and what did he clarify? Go ahead. Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. This is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the heavenly Father, make his path straight. So as John was baptizing those into the covenant, he was also being prepared to baptize the Messiah, the Prince. Let's read in the fourth verse. And the same John and his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins and his meat was locust with wild honey. So John the Baptist, he was, he, he didn't have on a, a garment unclean. It, he sheared the camel's hair and he had a leathern girdle about his loins, and he was eating of locusts and wild honey, which is still acceptable to partake. Verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region round about Jordan. There we get it one more time. Jordan, that wetland area. Verse 6. What, did, what was he doing in Jordan? Let's see. And were baptized of him in Jordan. There it is. And were baptized of him in Jordan. So after they got baptized, what else did they do? Confessing their sins. They repented from their wicked ways and they were coming under the covenant. But you always got naysayers. What were they saying? Verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees. So they, the Pharisees were coming. They were talking trash. And what is he doing? What did, I don't know what he was doing. What, what did John the Baptist say? When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So we shouldn't be like the Pharisees and Sadducees. We shouldn't be saying, oh, those brothers, that they, I don't know what they're doing. They talk about baptism or whatever it may be. How about you come and, and, and have a conversation with us so we can dive deeper into what baptism is instead of attacking and ridiculing your own fellow brethren. And to those who aren't in the Israelite community, it's, it really isn't a difference. They say, oh, no, we don't wash hands and feet. You only get dumped in the water, and then that's all you need. Well, that's not true. We just saw here how they were baptizing continually. How in the old covenant, it said they to wash their hands and feet consistently. 
Uh, we're going to drop that. Let's get uh, another example of that. Mark 1, and pick it up at the first verse, please, Rosh. The beginning of the gospel of Yahweh the Messiah, the son of Abba, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way, thy way before thee. Which shall prepare thy way before thee. Right? So we see that somebody was coming before the Messiah so that the Messiah may be baptized and so that the priesthood may be cleansed. Let's drop. Let's drop that and get Malachi 3 and, and verse 1. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Mosai, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Mosai of hosts. So this is a very misconstrued scripture. We just went over this yesterday and the day before on the Sabbath class. And whatever else, however many times we went over it, it's twofold. It's talking about both the Messiah, Yahweh Shai, and it's talking about John. So it's not one or the other. Just like in the Old Testament, we see sometimes it talks about both David and Yahweh Shai, or David and Moses. So when we see these scriptures, if, we, if you don't have the proper understanding, seek the Most High. By, by way of the priesthood so that you can get the understanding. And don't push out a false narrative. But let's go back over to Mark 1 and verse 3, picking up at where we just left off in regards to that messenger. Go ahead. Mark 1, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare, prepare ye the way. There it is. Prepare ye. Go, go ahead. Prepare ye the way of the Messiah. Prepare that way. Make sure everything is perfect. Make sure that he is ready so that he can be baptized. And in the audience, where would he be baptized at? Anybody know? I will. You guys say Jordan. We'll see. We'll see. Let's keep reading the fourth verse. Verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance. So we, we just get baptism once, baptism twice. It's like, hey, this, with the new covenant, the best thing that you can do is repent and be ye baptized. Who said that? Anybody know in the audience who said that? Repent and be ye baptized. You got John. Who else? It was one more. Well, yeah, I wish I talked about it too. Not in that order, but he talked about it. We got Peter talking about it in, in Acts. We'll get there. Um, grab that in Acts. So we got repent and be baptized. So all of the prophets, or should I say all of the apostles, spoke on his baptism. From Peter, Paul, Luke, Mark, as we see here, John, as we say, John the Baptist. And for the naysayers, they say John the Immerser to trip everybody up. But it really doesn't make a difference. The baptism is very important. Once again, and preach the baptism of repentance. So we get baptized or we get consecrated into the new covenant. And we do know that with the New Testament, the verbiage is sometimes different. So when we see baptism of repentance, we're saying, or we're seeing they're getting consecrated by way of the washing of the water, by the word, so that they can repent and come into the new covenant so that they can be free from their sins or free from those evil spirits of sin that have been holding us back for a long time. Let's get that fifth verse. Verse 5. Verse 5. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan. Come there we get it one more time. In that marshy, wet land of Jordan. So now we got infallible proofs showing that indeed we were baptizing in Jordan because it was a wet land. What, what were they doing when they were bap being baptized? Confessing their sins. And when it says baptize of him, anybody know exactly what that means? It's twofold one more time. Anybody know? Baptize of him. So we know that John were baptizing these people, right? But after that, let's just say in the seventh covenant, if we say baptize of him, what does that mean? 
We'll get there. We'll get there. Let's keep reading. Uh, we could drop the sixth verse. We just touched on that. Pick it up at the seventh verse. Mark chapter one, verse seven. And preached, saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me. So this is where we get a little confused. Collectively, the Israelites, we say, oh, we, we don't need to do baptism for this verse right here. Let's see it. The latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. So he was like, man, I, I don't want to baptize you. How is that? He's too great of a man. He's too powerful, too amazing. I'm nervous. And Yahweh came in. He said, look, we got to do this. I got to follow the will of the Most High Abu Yahweh. If everybody else got baptized just because I'm the son of man, that don't change nothing. I need to be baptized too. Let's keep reading. I indeed have baptized you with water. So he said, yes, I did. Absolutely, I baptized you with water. It doesn't stop there. I'm not saying you don't get baptized. But I'm saying after I baptize you, it's more to it. After you confess your sins, after you confess your trespasses, it's more to it. Oh, peace offerings. After you give your peace, after you give your thanks, it's more to it. What shall you be seeking? Let's see. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit. Just as uh, Priest Yohanna went over yesterday with the eyes of fly fire, we too shall be baptized with that Holy Spirit by way of the Messiah, the Prince. Verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Yahawashai came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. So Yahawashai, we, we don't have the time to go there today, but Yahawashai was like, man, you, you got to do this, John. I understand. I don't understand you reverence the high priest, Malak Zadok. I get it 100%. But we have to follow order. We have to follow instructions. This is the Messiah telling us this. The, the, essentially the second right hand of, of the Most High Yahweh. He said, even I need to be baptized so that I may prepare the way. Let's read. And, and straightway coming up. There it is, straightway, right? We say straightway meaning he was submerged fully in water. But if I get this cup, pour some water in here, and I submerge my hand, am I baptized? Am I good? According to what Moses said, grab that Exodus 30 real quick. Uh, Exodus 30, uh, I think it's the 17th verse. Um, read that one more time. And uh, Mark, go ahead. Please rush. Mark 1 verse 10. And straightway coming up out of the water. Meaning after he was baptized. He saw the heavens open. The heavens, the sky, the, it was open. And what happened? And the spirit. The like spirit of the Most High Abba Yahweh. What happened? Like a dove descending upon him. And he was like, oh, look at that. I'm well pleased. The, the son of man. The second, my right hand. Even he follows order. Even he follows instructions to the T. So why would we be any different? Let's drop that. We saw that. Uh, matter of fact, get that Exodus 30 with, with the example we just used. If I put my hand in this cup and my hand is full of water, so-called submerged, why do I need to dump in some water? And plus, it's not even spoken of anyway. Read Exodus 30 and 17. Let's see if it was spoken of. Exodus chapter 30 verse 17. And the Mosai spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a lava of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet there. There we got it. Wash your hands and your feet. And I honestly don't believe, like, no shots taken. You know, we got the sisters, you know, sometimes they like to put on makeup and like to fancy up their hair real nice. I honestly do not believe if we had to do full submersion, they would be like, nope, I'm not dumping in there. Go mess my hair up, go mess my, my face up with my makeup. I honestly don't believe so. So the most I knew what type of people he had, the washing of the hands and feet was permissible. Anything outside of that essentially was added on. 
Let's get Romans 6 and verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Yahweh the Messiah were baptized into his death? Mm, that's heavy. So as the Messiah consecrated the seventh covenant, if he was baptized into, into his death, then we are also dead to what? Let's read. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. And what was the Messiah dead to? Anybody know in the audience or online? What was Yahweh dead to? And we get it. Read that again from the top, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us were as baptized into Yahweh Shah. So if you Messiah, ain't coming by way of the seventh covenant, by way of the priesthood, washing those hands and feet as you come into the seventh covenant, how are you being baptized into the Messiah? Because he got his hands and feet washed. So how are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to do it any different? Absolutely not. It says, baptized into the Christ, we were also baptized into his death. So I've heard people say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm baptized in the Messiah. And then they say, yeah, we sin every day. I don't, I don't be understanding. But we get that clarification right here. Read that again. No, ye not. That so many of us as were baptized into Yahweh the Messiah were baptized into his death. Therefore, therefore, meaning because of this, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Meaning we through the baptism, through us coming into the seventh covenant by way of Yahweh, we are buried into death with the Messiah. Keep reading. That like as the Messiah was raised up from the dead. Remember the topic. The Messiah is here. He's active. You get these oblations going on. That like as the Messiah was raised up from the dead. Go ahead. By the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Right. So if we're in the Messiah, that means the Messiah is here right now. If we baptize in the Messiah, we baptize into the, the death of sin, meaning he's here with us right now. I mean, he could have been here last night when we was doing oblations. When we was feasting, he could have been right there with us. When we was eating our, 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 our good feasting food, you know what we do on the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, you know how we eat. He could have been right here with us, taking a small piece of that lamb off everybody's plate. He's here. What's the point of waiting? When did the most I ever say, wait? I mean, when he said, you didn't even say, wait for the old blessings. He said, come ahead time. You got to be there for the ninth hour, come at the eighth hour. You got to be at the eighth hour, come at the third hour. That's how you know the Messiah is here with us right now. We don't have to wait. If the Messiah said, look, after you come into the covenant, repent and go teach the gospel. Oh, that means he here with us. We already baptized with him. So you look at your brother, you look at your sister, you say, is the Messiah here? We both in the seventh covenant? The Messiah is here with us then. Let's keep reading. Romans chapter 6, verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. There it is right there. That's self-explanatory. Read that one more time. That's heavy. You can't, this is irrefutable. For those who say, oh, the Messiah is going to, he's coming down, waiting in 2023. Or should I say, in 2000, waiting in 2026, he'll be there. Or, you know, like we used to say back in the day, in the year 2000, the Messiah is coming. Well, he's already here. Why are we waiting? Why are we sitting back getting big and in our lazy chairs? Every feast of unleavened bread, we just eat lamb, and that's it. You know, like Priest Gabari said on the Day of Atonement, we just fast from cheeseburgers. We need to be fasting with the Messiah so that we can be in the Messiah. So we shouldn't be waiting for anything, but we should be like vigilantes coming ahead of time so when the messiah says oh snap i ain't even gotta say nothing to you you're already doing it you're already in the oblations let's keep reading though verse five oh if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection all right so if the messiah was crucified and he conquered sin that means sin is dead to the Messiah. And if we are in the Messiah, that means we too should be dead to sin. 
And if we too are dead to sin, who do we serve? Do we serve sin or do we serve the most high Abu Yahweh? All right, let's get that again. We're not going to do too much talking. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. By way of the new covenant, by way of Yahweh Shai, that body of sin may be destroyed. Keep reading. That henceforth we should not serve sin. There we got it. So y'all are absolutely correct. When it said we were baptized of him and we were baptized in him, who were we baptized in? He was baptized in Yahweh our high priest. He right there with us. Every time we wash, just believe, oh, yeah, the Messiah is right there with me. Matter of fact, he is the one baptizing me. So we baptize in, in the earthly lava because we need fleshly bodies. But that same lava that is in heaven, is the, that's what we get baptized in. That's the same lava Moses was baptizing in for 40 days and 40 nights. That's the same lava in which David saw. That's the same lava that Ezekiel saw. Let's drop that, though. Uh, pick it up at Ephesians 5 and 26. Arash, real quick, let's go back to Revelation 1 and pick it up at the, uh, I think that's the 15th verse. Yeah, verse 15. Revelations chapter 1, verse 15. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So when it mentions his voice as the sound of many waters, anybody in the congregation or on the chat online, anybody explain to us what that means? Say that again. His voice, that just means his voice is loud. Okay, we got two. Well, that is two. You know, his, his voice is deep and marvelous and powerful, but not specifically. Real general, we're going to be real specific. Uh, you said the washing of what was it? Moses washed the hands. You know, you think that's general or specific? We want to get specific because it says his voice is many waters, so we want to make sure we know exactly what that means. Eh, not quite what you say the other time. He said something after that. <laughs> What'd you say, sis, over there? And how is he performing the baptism? With spoken words. There we got it. Excellent. So everybody that says something, they were correct. But like we say, we want to make sure we get that bullseye. Um, go ahead and get that uh, Ephesians 5 and 26. Um, AP Hezekiah. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. And read that slow, too that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. With the washing of the water by the word. So most, most camps, most Israelites, most Hebrews, I'm not sure about the Christians. I don't keep up with them. They say, oh, the washing of the water by the word. Hey, go get Genesis 1. Go get Matthew 2. Master all these precepts. Oh, that's how you know you've been baptized. That's not the case. Revelations 20 and pick it up at the third verse. We're going to see what it really means for the washing of the water by the word. And if you've been following along, you probably know, but you already know, we have to prove all things. Revelations 20 and verse 4. Go ahead and read that when you got it. Revelations chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones that they set upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yahweh and for the word of Abba, in which. Had Go to the previous chapter, uh, Revelations 19 and verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Abba. There it is right there. His name is called who? The Word of Abba. The Word of Abba. A.P. Hezekiah, read that Ephesians 5 and verse 26 one more time. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So that, so that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by Yahweh who is 
the word of Abi Yahawa. So that clarifies and clears up the misnomer that Genesis 1, Matthew 2, memorize the whole book, the Apocrypha, memorize the book of Enoch. Not saying that those things are bad because we should know all of the scriptures, but that isn't what baptism is. To say, oh, I've been baptized because I know all these scriptures, that wouldn't be the case. Oh, I'm in a new covenant because I know all these scriptures. That's what it say here, right here, Ephesians 5. No, the word or Yahweh Shai is the word, and we are being washed by way of the word. But we're going to drop that, and we're going to get that a second look on why we say the voice as of many waters. Hebrew 13 and 15. So in the times of Moses, they washed, uh, you know, all of their sacrifices were carnal, or bullocks and rams. But in Hebrews, it's a little different. We're going to see what it is in Hebrews, how we give up those sacrifices. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to Abba continually. And how are we doing that sacrifice of praise? That is... The fruit of our lips. The fruit of our lips, meaning spoken, audible, Hebrew. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name, but to do good and communicate. Communicate, communicative, audible, spoken. Go ahead. But to do good and communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, Abba is well pleased. Right, so... This is why it says his voice as of many waters, because now we're speaking the baptism. The priesthood gets ready to do the oblations. We baptize. Then we bring up the congregation. We baptize. That's how it's done in this new covenant. Like we said earlier in the old covenant, it was different. But when we do baptize, just because you might see a small laver in front of the, the congregation where we worship, that doesn't mean that Moan C is right there. I know some may not know how the Moan Sea looks, so don't look it up online either. Please don't do that. I know nobody knows about the Moan Sea, or should I say, not many of us know. But indeed, when we're baptizing, the Messiah is right there, baptizing us in that Moan Sea for the priesthood and then the lavers for the congregation. He's right there with us. So the coming of the Messiah, he's already here. Every Passover, that Pesach, the Pesach sacrifice, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Let's believe the Messiah is in here. Now, you got Levin in the camp. Ah, the Messiah, he don't want to dwell in that. He too pure for that. He going to get the eyes of fire like Johanna spoke of, and then you just going to be consumed. But we're going to drop that, and let's pick it up at John 13 and 1. We're going to get another example of this baptism spoken of. Priest Ross, you can grab that John 13 and 1. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of Passover, when Yahawashai knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of, his, out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot. So we got the adversary, Hasatan, trying to figure out a way to taint the sixth, seventh covenant, which we know is not going to happen. David prophesied, said they're going to try to take our sacrifices. They're going to try to poison the Messiah with vinegar. It was already spoken of. He was already prepared. We already knew what was going to happen. Or should I say, yeah, how was I already knew? So he was ahead of, he was like a vigilante. He came beforehand to make sure this didn't happen. Let's keep reading. The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Yahweh shot knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from Abba and went to Abba. He rises from supper and laid aside his garment. So he took off his royal priestly garment. Did it? I heard some funny stuff about this, but he had on a, one set of garment. He put on another set of garment because he was about to prepare his disciples and bring them into the, the apostlehood or the, the official act of being a priest. Disciples simply meaning student. When you become higher up, you, you're now more so higher up in ranking. They were about to be baptized as priests. Let's read. 
John chapter 13, verse 4. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel. And so he used that towel so that he can wash his disciples' hands and feet. And girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin. Once again, now we know that this is cut and clear. You, you can't even get around this. How is it possible that you could be fully submerged your whole body in a small basin? Well, let's just say it's a big basin. If you how wish I did it, I mean, I know he was pretty strong, but he probably didn't want to have to move a big mountain sea 20 feet high. You know what I mean? Should I say 20 feet long or 100 feet wide? Whatever it may be, whatever the numbers you want to put out there. You got to, it has to be big enough where somebody could fit in. So how is this even possible where we dumping our whole bodies in it if he said, he poured water into a basin, small basin. Matter of fact, look up the etymology of basin real quick. Go ahead, Rosh. And began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. There it is right there. So he washed their feet, the disciples' feet. And what does Simon, uh, should I say, Peter say? Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Messiah. Does thou wash my feet? He like, whoa, hold up. Is this an act of humility? That's what we hear people say. Oh, you, you know, on the Passover, if you're the leader, you go and you wash everybody in the, in the congregation's feet. I mean, what does that do? I mean, uh, the scriptures say be humble. I mean, do we got to show our humility or we show our humility inward to the most high be our? So that, would that be the case? What y'all think? Or was he doing something else? He was preparing. What was he preparing for? All right, let's see that. Let's uh, continue reading, Priest Rosh. Verse 7. Yahweh answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now. See, you don't really know right now, but you're going to know soon. You must not have been paying attention to what John was doing, what Mark was speaking about, what Moses was talking about. What you forget, Peter? You know, Peter, you always forgetting. First you say you want to go deny me three times, which was prophecy. And he said, uh, I don't know, Yahweh, I don't think you should baptize me. Well, he didn't know he was saying that, but that's what he was saying. That's like for the priesthood saying, you know what, executive priesthood, uh, y'all hold off on that washing my hands and feet. Y'all how I'm low, don't do that. That's like us saying that. But that's like us saying, oh, most high, you, you, you too righteous. Uh, maybe you shouldn't do that, you know. But we know that's not the case. So it was just a lack of understanding. And if, if we pay close attention here, um, he asked, he said, wait, are you washing my feet? He didn't say, hey, hey, you, you don't need to wash my feet. He was confused. Well, I don't want to use the word confused. He just didn't properly understand. But what did Yahweh say? Verse 7? From, seven, from, from the top. Yahweh Shai answered and said unto him, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. There it is. You say, well, you may not know now, and then that's totally fine, but you're going to know after. Then what did Yahweh Shai say in the eighth verse? Verse 8, Peter said unto him, thou shalt never wash my feet. That's like saying uh, we, we should never have to go to work because we got to go to work for our enemies. That wouldn't be the case. You say, uh, Yahweh Shai, yeah, I know you're the anointed Savior. Uh, I know you're the rock. I don't think you should wash my feet. But what did Yahweh say? Yahweh answered him, If I wash thee not. Pay close attention to that. Go back to that Romans 6. That's a good example. Get that Romans 6 and pick it up at the fourth verse. Read that one more time. Yahweh answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Ooh, if you wash, if you do not allow me, if you don't get this washing of the water by Yahweh as the scriptures say, by the word, you have no part of me. Why would he have no part of the washing of the water by the word? Read that again, Romans 6, and pick it up at the fourth verse. Therefore, we are buried with him. by We're, we're buried with him by who? By baptism. Read that again, priest Rosh. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. No part with me. And for, uh, for a small exercise, Substitute that word baptism with wash. Read that again. Therefore, we are buried with him by washing into death. 
Oh, look at that. One more time. Let's just get one more time. Therefore, we are buried with him by washing into death. All right. We could drop that. Go back to that John called the chapter and verse. John chapter 13, verse 9. Simon, Peter said unto him, Messiah, not my uh, My bad, only. the eighth verse. Pick it up at the eighth verse. Verse 8. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Yahweh shall answer him, If I wash thee not. Or if I baptize thee not, as it says in Romans. And in John it says, If I wash thee not, then what? Thou hast no part with me. Mean you will not be buried to sin like Yahweh was dead to sin. If he washes you not. So for all those saying, yeah, we don't got to do baptism. Yeah, we don't got to do this. We ain't got to do that. You'll be wrong. You'd be wrong and you just be wicked because you can't free yourself from trespass and sin. So you got to get that baptism. It's essential and it's key. Let's keep reading in the ninth verse. Verse nine, Simon Peter saith unto him, Messiah. Now he like, oh, wait, hold up. Uh, I, I love me some Messiah. He's the high priest, the anointed savior. I'm trying to be where he at. He said, wait, don't wait. I, I, I take that back. I'm going to say something else. And what did he say? Not my feet only. He said, don't just do my feet. Go ahead. But also my hands and my he head. He said, do everything. My hands, my head, my body. Go ahead. I, I need to be there to, to sin like you, Yahweh Shai. That's what he was saying. But what did Yahweh Shai say in the 10th verse? Yahweh Shai say unto him, he that is washed needeth not to save to wash his feet. Meaning, it, when I baptize you, when I baptize your hands and feet, that's, that's good. Why is he saying that's good? Anybody know? Why he say you just got to do wash his hands and feet? Anybody know why how wish I said that? Look back to what we said earlier when we back, went back to the schoolmaster. Why he say, oh, you only need to do your hands and feet? Ah, because Moses, she, the sister said, because Moses did that with Aaron's sons. Who were Aaron's sons? What were they? They were priests. So if he's baptizing his disciples into their priesthood, what is Yahweh going to do? He's going to do exactly what the, what the law said do. Or should I say what the statue said do? Moses did that. He fulfilled that statue at that moment. Yahweh did the exact same thing. He didn't come doing nothing different. He did the exact same thing. Let's keep reading. He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. But not all. We know that this is talking about Judas. Uh, let's keep reading. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, no, yea, that Know ye what I have done to you. Meaning, you know, we just, you, just, you guys are now consecrated priests. So you, need, you guys go out, preach and teach the gospel. Give up those peace offerings. Preach and teach repentance. Let's keep reading. Ye call me master and Messiah. And ye shall, and ye say well, for I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, Yea, also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have told you. So that's, it, it seems mysterious to those who may not know about the schoolmaster, which is everything written of in the covenant of Moses. When he talks about the baptism and an anointing and all that good stuff and things related to the law and sacrifices and statutes and the commandments, Exodus 34. These are the Ten Commandments. So if you don't know much about the schoolmaster, it sounds a little mysterious. But essentially he's saying, look, I just consecrated y'all. I did this act to bring forth the kingdom of heaven, bring it forth on earth. I'm not going to be here long, but after everything happens, after this feast is over, I'll be right back. And next year's feast, I'll be right there with you. And 2,000 years later, 2,300 years, where we are right now, I'm still right here with you. So you look, you, you look to your left, you look to your right, you came in, you did those oblations, 
Best believe the Yahweh was in here. The angels, whoever it may be, the Messiah was indeed with us. We don't have to work. wait. Once again, why wait? If we could put the work in now, be vigilant, be diligent, and the Most High is already preparing the way for us. All right, let's, let's grab Acts 2 and 38. Um, as Yahweh did this, we're going to see somebody else saying the exact same thing. Acts 2 and verse, uh, pick it up at the 37th verse. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you. Repent and come into this new covenant, this covenant of David, the covenant of charity, mercy, and grace. All right, we're going to drop that. I just want to highlight that point. Uh, Priest Rosh, if you can, you go ahead and drop that, what you have. Uh, essentially what it's saying is after you've come under the covenant, go teach and preach the gospel by way of the priesthood, of course, and bring more into this seventh covenant. Have them get baptized. Let's pick it up at Hebrews 3 and the ninth verse. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, Wherefore, I was grieved with, the, with that generation and said, they do always error in their way, in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. So after we get uh, consecrated into the seventh covenant, um, you, you don't stop there. You keep pushing, you keep moving. It's a continual battle. You get baptized, you get consecrated to the covenant. That following day, time to get baptized again. That following day, baptized again. You, essentially, you have to wash your hands and feet until either the Messiah says the kingdom of, we, we hear, meaning, or should I say, until the time in which we're resurrected in that 7,000th year, or until the time we perish. Either way, you got to wash your hands and feet, meaning it's forever, meaning you don't stop. You sleepy? Hey, that's not an excuse. You tired, you sick, whatever it may be. Essentially, you get baptized daily, or you ain't gonna enter into the Most High's rest. Let's read. Uh, jump to for the sake of time. Jump to the fourteenth verse. Verse fourteen. For we are made partakers of the Messiah through His death, so that we too are dead to sin by way of the baptism. If we hold. The beginning of our confidence, steadfast until the end. Uh, jump to the next chapter, Hebrews 4, verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. So we got a high priest who showed us how to get consecrated into the covenant. He showed us how to give up those oblations that we, as we talked about earlier. He showed us why you wash your hands and feet as he went back to the covenant of Moses, and he showed us that, oh, you baptizing me mean you dead to sin. That's how great of a high priest we have. Keep reading. That is passed into the heavens. So if he's in, oh, just go ahead, read on first. Just read on first. Yahweh Shai, the son of Abba, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. So the Yahweh Shai came down just like us. Once again, he came down and he got baptized by John the Baptist so, so that he can lead and preach and so that he can be prepared to consecrate the seventh covenant. So us too, we're going to get tempted. We're just going to be rough. But one thing you know, two things for certain. You pick up that water, whatever you got, and you baptize. You get in those oblations. You don't fight. You don't stop. Anybody saying you only got to do it one time? If you get tempted, how are you going to pray to the Most High if you only got to do it one time? How are you going to be free, free of sin if you only got to wash your hands and feet one time? It, don't, it doesn't make sense at all. But let's get in the 16th verse. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of you grace. Think the, you think the Most High going to let you come into his tabernacle of the congregation boldly? Are you didn't baptize? I don't know about that. You might, as soon as you step foot, you might turn to ashes. Keep reading. Uh, matter of fact, drop that. 
Uh, and pick it up at Hebrews 5 and 10th verse. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 10. Called of Abba and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So he was after the order of Melchizedek as well. Verse 11, we still going to have people who say, nope, that ain't baptism. Got to dump them in the water. Got to wash, got to wash my makeup off. Got to get my hair wet. I got to go all the way at the bottom. I think really it's just for show, just to show people that, oh, I'm trying to change my life. But once again, you don't show that outwardly. You show that inwardly, and your righteousness and hum your humility will reflect outwardly. Go ahead. Of whom we have many things to say. Uh, we didn't talk about the, the covenant of Moses, how they did it. We didn't talk about how Yahweh talked to Peter. We didn't talk about how Peter told us, repent, be baptized. We didn't talk about John baptizing the Messiah. We didn't talk about he, how he prepared the way. Out of all these things, go ahead. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. Sometimes it is complicated and complex. That's true. We're not going to take that away. We're not going to say, oh, this stuff is easy. It's not. But it, it, it's hard to be uttered. But what about it? Seeing ye are dull of hearing. You just refuse to hear. You refuse to hear the words of the priesthood, the words of the Most High Abbey Howard. Because it's all through Scripture. Washing of the water by the word everywhere from... Uh, Ray Sheath, or the, the book of the first fruits, all the way down to Revelations, in between Enoch and Jasher, Jubilees, everywhere between. You got washing, baptism everywhere. Keep reading, call it chapter and verse. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. For when, for when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again. So we got to relearn, right? As Peter said, everything you thought you knew, just take it away and relearn it. Go ahead. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracle. So relearn this gospel, or should I say relearn what it means to be an Israelite. We relearn what it means to be tethered to the nation of Israel. You thought you was a priest or uh, like, you know, we like to call in the camps, the Kohanim or whatever it may be, even though that's the correct term. But you thought you were a priest or whatever it may be, and you don't know this, this is okay. But don't take the information and say, look, I know how to do it. Now, come, come join us and learn what it means to baptize and repent, come into the seventh covenant so that you can give up those Thanksgiving offerings, so that you can give your tithe offerings, so the priesthood can give the trespass and sin offerings, so that we may all be free of evil, free of wickedness, so that we can be right next to the Messiah. Today, tomorrow, seven years from now, 14 years from now, the great jubilee from now, whichever it may be. Let's keep reading. And are become such as have need of milk. So, yeah, you, at one point you do need that milk. But what else? And not of strong meat. And then right now it may not be the time for you. You know, it may not be that time now. But eventually you're going to need it. Well, let's see that. Verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Meaning you, you, you might be... You're a little unskillful. You're using that milk. Saying, yeah, I don't eat no pork. I keep the Sabbath. I keep the holy days. I'm doing it to the best of my abilities, which isn't found in the scriptures. But anyway, let's keep reading. For he is a babe. So you using that milk. you teaching on that, uh, yeah, just don't eat pork. I'm not saying these things are wrong. But you teaching don't eat pork, keep the Sabbath, do the holy days to the best of your abilities. For 40, 50, 60, 70 years, that's all you do? Are you unskillful? You gotta step that, you gotta step that righteousness up. You gotta put more work in. You gotta seek the most high more. Verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. So when you grown, when you are fully developed, you come get that meat. You come get these meat offerings, the drink offerings, by way of the priesthood, and you partake in these seven covenant oblations. Let's read on. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Have, having their senses exercised to do what? To discern both good and evil. Utilizing those seven pillars so that after you walk through the seven pillars, now you're in the, the heavens. Now you're in the third heaven, all the way up to get to the Most High Abiyahawah so that you can utilize 
the seven pillars of wisdom righteously to discern what is good, the washing of the water by the word, and what is evil. Meaning, oh, I don't got to do that just one time and I'm good. It doesn't make sense once again. Let's go ahead and close this class out in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. It's, it's very strange how we say, oh, we don't got to get baptized. After all of the prophets and the forefathers say, hey, go get baptized. But we're going to go ahead and see it one more time for the naysayers. We didn't say it the naysayers like 10 times, but we'll make it 11 times. Hebrews 6 and 1. Hebrews 6 and 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of the Messiah, let us go. Let us go. So on. he said, uh, let me actually take a step back. But strong meat belonging to them that are full age. So after all this, therefore, meaning because of these things, we're leaving the principles of the doctrine of the Messiah. The, the Messiah taught us to be free of sin. You see your brother um, uh, got sin on him? Hey, help your brother out. You see a sister, help a sister out. You see the children messing up? Go talk to them. Have a conversation with them. He said, love, love your neighbor. Treat your neighbor as you would treat yourself. He said, keep these high holy days. He said, come with the bread and the wine, bless it and multiply it. The doctrines of the Messiah. So if you're not teaching these things, are you really preaching the doctrine of the Messiah? Let's, let's see what else he said. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of the Messiah, let us go on unto perfection. Let us go on to perfection. Completion. Go ahead, priest. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead work and of faith toward Abba. Of the doctrine of baptism. There it is right there. It's an actual practice. You go back to uh, Moses. You go over to Solomon. You look at Ezekiel, David. They all said, look, I didn't wash my hands and feet. Um, real quick, A.P. Hezekiel. If you can, let's get an example of David real quick. Let's get um, the book of Psalms. Uh, and let's pick it up at the 26th chapter. Or should I say, the, not the book of Psalms, 2 Samuel 12 and verse 20. We're going to see another example of this washing, even from the covenant bearer. Everybody did the same thing. So if you see yourself doing something different than those of antiquity, then you might be doing something wrong. If you see yourself doing something right, meaning you have moving sin, you're doing up these oblations. You're keeping the high holy days. You're doing something right. Just keep on doing it. Get that 2 Samuel 12 and 20. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself. There it is right there. Back to back. He washed, then he anointed. David also said, I shall wash my hands in innocency. Why, why, why he doing that if you don't got to do it no more? And then he says, I will come after the order of Melchizedek. Then he spoke about the Messiah on a numerous amounts of occasions. Many times. We don't got time to go over it, but it's all throughout the book of Psalms. Priest Ross, go back to that Hebrews 6 and the second verse. Verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptism. The doctrine of baptisms, one. And of laying on of hands. Laying on of hands, too. So laying on of hands is not just, you know, you doing this and you said, ha, blah, blah, blah. Not that crazy stuff. But we're talking about you laying on of hands like they laid, like they put, like the priesthood in antiquity in the covenant of Moses put their hands on the goat and on those sin offerings so that that sin offerings can be brought back to the um, brazen altar so that it may be consumed. So we got the doctrine of baptism, which is the voice of sound of many waters, and laying on of hands. And what else we got? And of resurrection of the dead. And of eternal judgment. And of eternal judgment and resurrection of the dead. By way of coming into the seventh covenant through the consecration, washing your hands and feet so that you may be saved with the Most High Abu Yahweh. We, you know, we got to endure to the end. And what did he say in the third verse? And this will we do if Abba permits. If Abba permits, if Abba says, wash your hands and feet, if he says, preach the gospel, laying on the hands, Resurrection of the dead, that means he per permits it. That means we have the opportunity to fight continually so that we can reign with the Messiah all the days of our life. 
And with that, we're going to conclude today's class and we'll open the floor for questions. First in the audience, then we'll go online. You got any questions? Shalom. Shalom. Um, my question is, um, first of all, a uh, great class. Man. All praise to the Most High. Um, my question is surrounded around um, the verse where it says, um, washing with the word. Bef bef the, uh, the verse before it, has, it's, it speaks something about how we should treat our wives. Can, could you read it? It's, uh, um, I'm trying to see which, which verse it is real quick. All right, back in Ephesians, right? Yes, sir. All Ephesians right. 5, 24. 25. AP has a care. If you can grab that. All right. Now, what was the question again? Um, in in uh, 525, it references um, it references wives, and then it also references uh, Christ. Um, my my question is the washing of the word and how how we um how we get washed in the covenant of marriage that we have with our Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Is 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 it that we we treat the we treat the same marriage and covenant with our Yahweh the same way we would deal with the washing of our wives. Like if you can go to uh that second verse, chapter two, verse chapter five, verse two. Uh start, matter of fact, just start at the first verse. Ephesians chapter five and one. Be ye therefore followers of Abba as their children, and walk in love, as Messiah also had loved us. And I'd given. All right. Now go back to, you said, be ye followers of the Most High, Abi Yahweh. Go back to the fourth chapter and pick it up at the 29th verse. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of Abba, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, so and, got bitterness keep reading. and wrath, wrath and anger, anger and clamor, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So all those traits, put it away. For what reason? Verse 32. And be ye kind one to another. Be Ten kind one to another. Tender-hearted. Tender. Forgiving one another. So when we say tender-hearted, we're not looking like in the, the curses in Deuteronomy when it's talking about um, and you shall have an evil eye towards your wife and your wife have an evil eye towards you. We're not talking about that. We're talking about being meek, walking with humility, long-suffering, all those things in regards to tender-hearted. Let's see what else it says. Forgiving one another. Forgiving one another. Even as Abba. For Yahweh Shai's sake had forgiven you. So even as the Most High Abba Yahweh forgave us by way of Yahweh Shai. Now let's go back to chapter 5 and pick it up at the second verse. And walk in love, as Yahweh Shai also had loved us, and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to Abba for a sweet-smelling savor. So as the Messiah, the Prince, loved us, by way of keeping the Most High's commandments, his high holy days, his laws, his statutes, we too are supposed to render that same affection and, uh, for lack of a better word, care to our wives and vice versa, husbands to wives and wives to husbands. Now let's go back to that where we were. Uh, the, what was that verse? Uh, 5 and 25. Okay, let's 
Let's get that right there. Uh, let's start at the 20th verse. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto Abba and the Father in the name of our Lord Yahweh Shai Messiah. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of Abba. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Messiah is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Messiah, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. So as the Messiah came and he rendered much grace, peace, charity, long-suffering, mercy, with the covenant of, or should I say, with the congregation of Israel, we too should share that same compassion and affection. Uh, pick it up at that next verse. That 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Messiah also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So that your union may be clean, pure, on track all the days of your life. And we, but we also know that washing of the water by the word is talking about the baptism through the Messiah, the Prince. So it's twofold, but specifically with that 26th verse, we're talking about making sure that we got that, that washing of the water by Yahweh Shai the Messiah. Any other priests want to add on to that? Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, so does that mean that Washing of the word, let's say for instance, um your 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 um you do you baptize and anoint and do all that with with your wife. That's what I'm trying to say. Like do you do that in times of of uh tension? Yeah, remember I think uh for the feast of weeks we talked about that actually with um Tobit and Tobias. I forget which one off the top. But when they were having issues, they came to the most side together, unified. To make sure that whatever issues that they did have would go away. So, of course, we know sometimes we'd be on the go, we'd be on the run, so we can't always do it collectively with our wife. But if we got the opportunity, why not? You know, get in that oblation together, a cause, me and men. Y'all need salvation, hop in salvation. You need the, the, the fulfilling of the law for whatever you need, hop in your kim. Collectively, you know, so that's essentially a right on point. Come all praises. Uh, so we have two questions online, both from uh, Joseph Fernandez. Uh, his first question is, uh, will there be a physical coming of Jesus or everything happen in one's chamber of imagery? So most importantly, like Priest Johannes said, uh, we should be looking forward to that spiritual aspect, right? Um, I know that we marvel about the coming of the Messiah in the flesh, right? Like I said earlier, he might have been here yesterday. We right here in the flesh with us. But if we too focus on the flesh, and he, we was here yesterday, when we were in oblations, we might have missed them. So the key is to focus on the spirit so that when that day comes, we don't have to say, oh, snap, I missed the Messiah. I was looking, I was looking from my carnal eyes. So that, we do know that it is both twofold. But most importantly, we're looking at the resurrection from the spirit. Returning back to the city of Adam, and going to the throne of the Most High, Abi Yahweh. Right. Let me add to that as well, because I spoke more to that. Is that um, the we speak about the first and the second resurrection in res in Revelations? Um, the Messiah is coming first in your chamber of imagery to collect those who are His, and then they will be a part of that return that everybody is talking about. But He's not returning to collect anybody there. He's coming to change the whole world at that moment. So it's two parts happening. We're going to be going through that in prophecy. You want to be part of that first resurrection. You want to be those whom he choose to take from this realm, remold, shape in the image of the Allah or Elohim, and then return being a part of his mission to conquer, replace, and change this whole world. All right. And bless are those who take part in that first resurrection. Those who take part in that first change. They are those who will reside in heaven 
are in the kingdom of the Most High. Just like the sons of Seth was on that holy mountain, they got adopted and became the children of the Heavenly Father. Everybody wasn't children of the Most High, but they were. And so that's what it's talking about. There will be a physical uh, return, but it's not like how what is being reported out there by, you know, Christian churches or in Islam. That first part is to come take, pick up his army, his soldiers, and to equip them. Then they're coming back to set this place in order. That's it. All right, and our last question, once again from Joseph Fernandez. Uh, it's not necessarily related to class, but he's asked, uh, outside the day watch, during the night watch, do we still baptize and anoint before speaking to our Abba? As I know, we do not do any sacrifice during the night watch. Uh, so, uh, essentially, at the moment, the, the priesthood is doing the 12 hours of the day watch, right? And we know that the angels cover the night watch. You tether your prayers to the night watch, but if we're the children of the day, put extra emphasis if, if you don't have a priest or who's able to do that consistently, which in most cases that won't happen, put your extra emphasis on the day watch. So we know that the baptism is rendered by the priesthood. So all I'm saying is put extra emphasis on the day watch and try your hardest, do your best not to miss it. Get in two of them, four of them, six of them. We got some people, they didn't did eight the other day. Put extra emphasis on that day watch. All right. Oh, no more questions online or in the audience. So may peace and thanksgiving offerings be multiplied. Shalom.